Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Colette Stewart, the Chief Executive of ONUS, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to our 12th annual award ceremony of our Workplace Charter on Domestic Violence. The past year has continued to be a very challenging environment as we adapt to new ways of working to meet ever increasing demand for support for victims of domestic or sexual abuse. We're here tonight to recognise, share and celebrate some of the new ways we've continued to combine skills, knowledge and understanding to facilitate new partnership projects. But first, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first speaker this evening, Jean Brady, the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Thank you, Colette. Um, I'm truly honoured and delighted to be given the opportunity to talk about the important role that an employer can play in supporting colleagues, um, in, in supporting colleagues who are at risk of or suffering domestic and, and or sexual abuse, and to share information on how the Northern Ireland Civil Service is stepping up to ensure all colleagues know there is help available. Before I do so, however, I'd like to highlight the work of the Northern Ireland Executive in developing a strategy to tackle violence against women and girls. We have been working across departments and agencies in Northern Ireland for over 25 years to tackle domestic violence, yet despite our best efforts, the statistics are getting worse. During the pandemic, Northern Ireland had the second worst femicide statistics in Europe. Between 2002 and 2021, the reported rates for sexual and domestic abuse offences have doubled. While this may represent some increase in reporting, that does not explain the whole of the increase. In a large majority of these cases, the victims are women or girls. Violence against women and girls includes, but goes beyond domestic abuse and sexual violence. We know that unwanted behaviours which cause anxiety and fear are experienced by women and girls across Northern Ireland. We also know that these behaviours won't change unless we all work to change the root causes, the culture, attitudes and environment that breeds violent behaviour. Achieving that objective will require alignment across a range of policy areas, including, for example, the gender equality strategy and the domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy. The strategy will use data analytics, people's lived experiences and evidence from other countries to focus on what work works. It will also aim to be a conscious example of genuine whole of government and whole of society collaboration. In terms of the civil service, as an employer with around 23,000 staff, we need to be mindful of research that has shown employees experience abuse can feel safer at work than at home. Work can be the place where someone can make a phone call or an appointment to look at a website without someone else stopping them. Work colleagues may be the only people that someone living with domestic abuse talks to on a regular basis. Work can be the base from which someone can start to put together a plan to keep themselves safe. We must, as an employer, consider how we can monitor safety and well-being amongst our staff working from home and retain the option for colleagues to access support from the workplace if home is not safe. We need to empower colleagues to respond to disclosures, to recognise risk and to be aware of the full range of organisations available to support any victim of domestic abuse, regardless of gender or sexual orientation. Abusive relationships can impact greatly on the working life of the victim. This can result in the deterioration performance, increased absenteeism or poor timekeeping, which can threaten job prospects and job security. Some may be coerced to leave their jobs altogether in order to reduce their financial independence. If individuals decide to leave the home to escape abuse, they'll need their salaries more than ever. Once they attempt to leave, abusive partners victim can be especially vulnerable going to or leaving work or while they're at home as the abuser knows where they are can be located. This can give rise to health and safety issues and an increased risk whilst in the workplace. So there is a huge role for an employer to play in helping to keep employees safe, signposting to help and support and to help them rebuild their lives. I am proud that the Northern Ireland Civil Service has stepped up first to revisit 
and revise our workplace policy on domestic and sexual abuse, and then to invest in training. I'd like to credit our HR team within the Department of Finance, who along with colleagues in the Departments of Health and the Departments of Justice took forward their policy and training work as a priority in the midst of the pandemic. Our domestic and sexual abuse policy offers protection to any member of staff who discloses that they may be or have been affected by domestic and sexual abuse, regardless of where the abuse has taken place. And wherever the perpetrator of abuse is a member of staff, we have undertaken to deal properly and effectively with that. The policy and guidance also sets out a range of support measures that may be available. For example, special leave to facilitate practical arrangements, meetings with a solicitor, viewing properties or getting advice from domestic abuse organisations, considering a temporary or permanent change of workplace or working pattern, moving the employee to a desk position where they are not visible from reception points or ground floor windows, and potentially financial help to support alternative arrangements to protect them. The policy also provides advice on available support and highlights how a manager or a colleague may assist those affected by domestic and sexual abuse by outlining a list of behaviours associated with abuse and providing examples of questions and prompts that can be used to support any conversation they may want to start with the employee. And we're working in partnership with ONUS to deliver training to staff and now have a list of safe place advocates who are the designated points of contact for colleagues needing help or support. The training is crucial in helping to embed and support the implementation of our workplace policy and to ensure that we're offering the right support for those who need it most. We want all civil service colleagues to know that the Northern Ireland Civil Service is a safe place for them. Thank you, Claude. Thank you, Jane. <clears throat> and it was our great pleasure to work with the staff from the Northern Ireland Civil Service on their policy development, training and communication of the workplace policy to support any employee experiencing domestic abuse. We've continued to work with PSNI as a safe place partner this year, training officers to deliver our safe place webinars. These webinars included a range of regional open sessions and also included targeted sessions focusing on supporting community pharmacists to implement the Ask for Annie initiative. The webinars addressed recognising domestic abuse, how to respond to disclosure and the range of services available for anyone in the community. Before we hear from Detective Chief Inspector Lindsay Fisher, we are going to see a short clip from two of the officers delivering safe place in the community. We are working in partnership with ONUS to make safe place training available free of charge to any pharmacy in Northern Ireland. We are encouraging all pharmacies to sign up to safe place to help us build safer communities for everyone. Pharmacies play an important role in our society and have the opportunity to signpost those experiencing domestic abuse towards help and support. Safe Place provides training and resources to assist pharmacy staff. This training can be used independently or in conjunction with the Ask for Annie scheme running in many pharmacies. We would encourage all pharmacies to register for training by clicking on the link below. We look forward to seeing you all in a webinar soon. Okay, I'd now like to introduce Detective Chief Inspector Lindsay Fisher. Hopefully my camera is now working, thank you. Um, and it's a great privilege um, to be here speaking tonight um, on the subject of, of domestic abuse um, and obviously our, our close working relationship with ONUS um, over the last number of years. Um, and I suppose that's just um, where I would like to start in terms of our, our partnership working uh, with our training. Um, and we have got a number of advocates, um, as, as Brady has referenced, in terms of uh, working with yourselves to develop uh, that training and, and delivery. We're anticipating that we will have additional uh, ONUS advocates trained over the next number of weeks. And really that's one of the starting points um, whenever we look to try and introduce domestic abuse champions across the organisation. Um, so from July 2020 to 
uh, the first of sorry the 30th of June 2021 there were over 19 and a half thousand domestic abuse crimes that's an increase of four percent on the previous year and the highest 12 month period since 2004 2005 I mean I think we all recognize the challenges that that presents and it's really through working in partnership and in collaboration with yourselves, with other uh, SMEs and charity organisations to really highlight and enhance the support to victims of domestic abuse and give them an opportunity for a voice and a pathway to support. There's a couple of um, different initiatives that I want to focus on from a policing perspective. And I think first and foremost, um, I would like to, to just say a, a couple of words in respect of our training and delivery around the new Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, which we'll hopefully see implemented um, early in 2022, in February 2022. I'm really pleased to be able at this juncture to say we have over 4,300 people trained within the organisation on recognising the signs and symptoms of coercive control, how to recognise this, how to support victims, uh, and most importantly, uh, how to secure and preserve evidence around that whenever we are attending domestic abuse calls. We also have three other modules focusing on the legislative module itself, on uh, impact of domestic abuse and on pathways to support and for those particular modules which were only launched in the last number of weeks we have almost 1,000 frontline officers and supervisors trained. This is going to be further supported over the next um, number of months by creating domestic abuse champions and that's almost 300 people across the organisation uh, including those within public protection, frontline officers, custody, call handling and of course our onus advocates um, to really be that conduit to recognise good practice and to work through case studies and really enhance our operational, um, operational response because Whilst training is one thing and it is the very first step, it's really important that we are able to deliver on that in a practical sense. So there's a significant amount of work from, from a policing perspective going in to make sure that we can deliver that and deliver it well. But we wouldn't be able to do that without our partners. Uh, Women's Aid, Rainbow, MAP, we have worked with so many um, partners to produce this training. Um, secondly, and, and also a relatively new uh, initiative um, is in respect of our advocacy scheme, which I'm really pleased uh, we were able to launch with the Department of Justice uh, on the 1st of September, which sees advocacy service to, uh, provided to domestic and sexual abuse victims who are engaging with the criminal justice system um, and those who are self-referring through uh, the SARC, the Rowan, uh, and also those that are coming in uh, via the MARAC route. And I think that's going to be uh, a real change in terms of how we're able to lead people through the, the criminal justice system. And we've, we've seen great success in terms of the uptake um, to date, uh, where we had been anticipating um, you know, in around 50% uptake. And we are already seeing that um, and expect that to continue over the coming weeks and months. Uh, we do have 15 advocates um, across the, the SARC and uh, various police estates. Uh, and also three lead advocates. We are continuing to recruit to try and get to uh, that magic number of 20 advocates. Um, and uh, hopefully we will be able to do that in the, the coming weeks and months. Um, last year, actually this time last year, saw the launch of the public protection notice, which for, coming from a Sajini recommendation, it is an opportunity to focus on the really that the first level response, the risk assessment from frontline officers and also the supervisor and um, being able to assess that risk and best put in um, the, the support around that. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we're continuing in that development and trying to put that online so that officers are able to um, do that remotely whilst they're out so that they're not coming into stations, but they're not having to make um, lengthy calls to our, our colleagues. Um, in call handling uh, and be able to do that while still um, being able to respond to, to calls. Um, obviously, we're also preparing, I'm conscious of time, uh, we're also preparing for a number of, of legislative um, provisions. Um, and I just want to touch on the stalking um, protection bill firstly, because I'm really pleased again to say that we're working really closely with um, our SME, Susie Lamplew Foundation, uh, our, 
I'm really pleased to say came on board and have reviewed our service instruction and, and our offering their guidance and support around that to make sure that we really get this right because for too long offences of this nature have gone undetected um, or have been crowned as harassment and, and really I want to make sure that we are delivering a, a training package and a support piece um, to, to make sure that we can better support victims. Um, and just finally, uh, I'm, I'm also really pleased to say that the Operation Encompass uh, pilot, which we see in the Downpatrick um, School, Downpatrick and Newcastle Schools area, um, is already again receiving really positive feedback, both from the teachers who feel that they're able to better support our children and young people in that education setting, but actually anecdotally from parents who are saying, I feel better knowing that my my school, my child's teacher knows what's going on at home. Um, and, and whilst you know, that's not taking the place of statutory organisations to support families, I think it's really important to highlight um, the, the work that we're doing with the Education Authority, police and others to, to be able to support this pilot. And we're already, even though we only launched in September, we're already looking uh, with education and with the, the trust on how to further extend that across um, other parts of, of Northern Ireland in advance of the legislative provisions going live. Uh, and on, there's so many other initiatives that are, that are going on in the background, but I just wanted to focus um, on, on those particular areas and obviously to, to highlight the, the continuing work with, um, with ONUS and with our other SMEs in this, this area. And again, thank you very much for being invited to, to speak um, this evening. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. And thanks as always to PSNI for their continued support. It gives me very great pleasure to welcome our next speaker this evening, Justice Minister Naomi Long. Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation um, just to join with you all this evening. I'm really delighted to be here, not least of all because at one stage this evening I wasn't entirely sure that I would make it through, but technical hitches aside, um, I'm delighted to be here um, at the 12th Annual Awards Ceremony showcasing the determination and the dedication of many people in the statutory voluntary community and private sector right across Northern Ireland in dealing with the very serious issue of domestic abuse. I want to take the opportunity not only uh, to thank you for inviting me to speak um, at the event, but also for the commitment and time that ONUS as an organisation provide, um, spend in providing support and assistance to those affected by domestic abuse. This is an initiative of which both I and my department are fully supportive. I'd also like to honour and to congratulate all of those who are receiving awards tonight, either for the first time or as long-time partners in the ONUS initiative. It's particularly encouraging for me to see the wide range of organisations that are being recognised tonight. As we know, uh, domestic abuse permeates all sections of society. We all have a responsibility to recognise and to help address it with a critical role for government, as well as our statutory and voluntary sector partners. From an executive perspective, I'm pleased that the new domestic and sexual abuse policy was recently introduced for the civil service. That policy quite rightly operates on the basis that anyone can be a victim of domestic or sexual abuse, and that for many employees, their workplace is their safe place. Um, I know that you will have heard this evening more on this um, from Jane Brady as Head of Civil Service in regard to that policy. I'm also very pleased this evening to be able to report on the substantial progress that has been made in recent years. Much of this is multi-agency and multi-partner, with critical um, focus on the fact that we must work together collectively to do all that we can to address domestic abuse. For my department, our progress has only been possible through those close collaborative working partnerships with our criminal justice and voluntary sector partners. Since becoming Justice Minister 18 months ago, I've made it clear that pro progressing domestic abuse legislation and policy is a key priority for me and for the department in collaboration with our partners. The need for this legislation has never been clearer for the thousands of women and men across Northern Ireland who wake each morning feeling frightened, controlled, isolated, degraded, humiliated or ashamed in their own homes, always on their guard, waiting for the next attack, whether that be physical or psychological. What is worse is that the abuser is a partner, a close family member, 
the person who sits across from them at the dinner table, someone that they should be able to trust completely, but tragically they can't. My first piece of legislation as Justice Minister was the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act Northern Ireland 2021, which received royal assent earlier this year. This creates a new domestic abuse offence locally that closes a gap in the current law and ensures that protection is not limited only to physically violent behaviour as at present. It sends a clear message that domestic abuse in all of its forms, both physical and non-physical abusive behaviour, is wrong and will not be tolerated. At the heart of the new offence is ensuring that as wide a range of abusive behaviours as possible can be captured. It will capture patterns of abusive behaviour by family members, intimate partners, as well as former partners. We want to ensure that there can be no escape for individuals that abuse those closest to them. Work is ongoing to introduce the offence around the end of February. It will be a leap forward for victims and also provide police with the necessary tools to intervene earlier and stop domestic abuse from escalating. I know that considerable work is being undertaken by partners in the police and public prosecution service to train their staff for the new offence in going live. And you heard something about that just now. This will also be accompanied by a range of training, including an e-learning package, a digital package to raise public awareness and a multimedia advertising campaign so that we can raise awareness of domestic abuse and the new offence right across society. The advertising campaign will be launched next year across a range of platforms to reach as wide an audience as possible. Through this, we want to do all that we can to raise awareness of both domestic abuse and specifically the new offence so that victims of domestic abuse know they are not alone and that help and support is available. However, as well as work on the new domestic abuse offence, I introduced domestic homicide reviews last December so that collectively we can seek to learn important lessons from those tragic circumstances. Those reviews are not about apportioning blame. They are rather about providing an insight from which we can learn lessons going forward. The panel members include a wide range of organisations across the criminal justice, education and health sectors, as well as our voluntary sector partners. Work is also ongoing in relation to domestic abuse protection notices and protection orders which will enhance the protections available to victims of domestic abuse. Along with our partners, we're also committed to ensuring that victims of domestic and sexual abuse have access to the right support. My department funds a range of domestic and sexual abuse support services, including the 24-hour domestic and sexual abuse helpline, behavioural change programmes across Northern Ireland, and domestic abuse initiatives taking for taken forward by policing and community safety partnerships. My department, in partnership with the police, recently launched a new advocacy service, which will provide support information and a single point of contact for victims of domestic and sexual abuse, accessing it on their journey through the justice system. The service is being introduced on a phased basis and is available to men, women, LGBTQI individuals, young people and adults who are qualifying victims. In addition, a domestic violence and abuse disclosure scheme has been in place since 2018. This allows police to share relevant information about one person's history of domestic abuse. This aims to keep people safe by helping protect potential victims and allowing them to make informed choices on whether they wish to continue in their relationships. Turning to further legislative change, the Domestic Sexual Offences, uh, the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill seeks to enhance public safety by implementing certain elements of the report of the Gillen Review of Serious Sexual Offences Cases relating to anonymity, privacy, as well as a review of the law on child exploitation and other sexual offences against children. I believe that taken collectively, the provisions of the bill will provide valuable additional protections for the most vulnerable within our community. For example, the bill proposes the creation of new offences to deal with the highly intrusive behaviours of upskirting and downblousing. This will bring us into line with neighbouring jurisdictions and will close a gap in our law. The bill also seeks to strengthen law on sexual offending to better protect children from sexual exploitation, with the creation of four new offences, which will deal with adults masquerading as children. The new offences will target predatory behaviour at an earlier stage, 
where offenders pretend to be children and communicate with them with a view to carrying out further offences. I also propose to bring forward amendments to the Bill at Consideration stage. This will include what is known as the Rough Sex Defence Amendment, which would preclude the use of such a defence where violent acts causing serious injury have been committed for the purposes of sexual gratification. The amendments will also include proposals to extend the scope of the current revenge pornography offence to include threats to disclose and to widen the scope of the current abuse of position of trust offences so that offences committed in non-statutory settings of faith and sport are also captured. Alongside this, there is a broader review of the law's treatment of non-fatal strangulation. Non-fatal strangulation can cause extremely serious injuries, but can also be a strong indicator and a precursor to increasing violence. My intention is to both raise awareness of these issues and to provide a more robust framework for dealing with this kind of offending. Any new legislation will be introduced early in the next Assembly mandate. The Protection from Stalking Bill, which is currently going through the Assembly, will also strengthen the law by introducing a new specific offence of stalking, which will be better focused on recognising stalking behaviours and the risks associated with stalking, something the current harassment law does not do. The bill also creates the offence of threatening and abusive behaviour, which can be triggered by a single incident. These new offences have stronger and more appropriate penalties and protections than are available under current harassment legislation, and I anticipate that these will become law by summer 2022. Importantly, the bill also introduces stalking protection orders. These orders will be a key tool for police, enabling them to intervene early prior to any conviction. Using them, police can disrupt stalking behaviours before they become entrenched or escalate in severity, and through them, protect victims from the outset when there is an immediate risk of harm. We know all too well that many of the abusive behaviours that I've referred to will disproportionately impact on women and girls, although anyone in our society can be a victim. Work is being progressed by the Executive on a Violence Against Women and Girls strategy, and I know that the police are also taking forward work in this area. I, along with my department, want to do all that we can to support these. What is particularly important to me is focus on changing attitudes and behaviours, societal discourse, gender inequality, and ensuring that there is meaningful change upstream on preventative initiatives and a commitment to changing societal attitudes through more targeted education and relationship awareness. There is a need for a more joined up approach to change the conversation and tackle relevant issues early on. We all have a part to play in this. In many ways, by the time people reach the Department of Justice, it is too late. The harm has been done. We now need to move upstream and tackle the underlying attitudes which cause this kind of violence. My department and the Department of Health are also working collaboratively to develop a new cross-cutting domestic and sexual abuse strategy. We intend to seek the public views on this, as well as engage with our stakeholders more generally. This will help us consider the challenges and opportunities as we plan ahead to see how, along with our partners, we can most effectively address domestic and sexual abuse, raise awareness, support victims and address offending behaviour. In summary, whilst pleased with the extensive progress made to date working together with our partners to address a wide range of abusive behaviours across Northern Ireland, we are committed to continuing to make progress in tackling what are very prevalent and important issues. Finally, turning back to this evening's event, I want to offer my very sincere congratulations to everyone receiving award, whether for the first time or whether for the, the, a number of times. I believe we all have a significant part to play in addressing domestic abuse. It is a priority for the department, and I am pleased that this evening we are recognising those for whom it is also a priority in our community. Thank you for all that you do in terms of supporting those who are victims of domestic abuse, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister, um, and thank you very much for being able to contribute to tonight's event. Women's Aid, Antrim, Balmina, Carrick, Fergus, Lauren and Newton Abbey are another of our Safe Place partners. This year we worked in partnership with them to reinforce and develop the support they had been delivering to schools prior to lockdown. 
We're going to hear from school principal Emma Quinn first from Rathcool Primary School. We are a community school in the middle of a huge community and we work really well with our parents and our children. We were finding that more and more parents were coming to us and disclosing things about their home life and about their situations and we realised that as a, as a school and as a staff that we had to really educate not only our families but also our children in terms of what domestic um, abuse looked like and to be able to recognise the signs and symptoms and that certainly started with um, looking at the education of of the staff and the whole school community. We are a nurturing school and part of that in our school is that we know that behaviour is communication and to go alongside that we also know that language is a vital means of communication. What Safe Place has enabled us to do along with our other PDMU curriculum and NSPCC is teach the, teach the children the skill set that they need, give them the language, give them the reactions, give them the situations and the role play and be able to recognise what domestic violence looks like, how to recognise it, but also to recognise the feelings and emotions that they have and be able to know when it gets uncomfortable and whenever then they can reach out and ask for help with the safe adults in school and that it's okay to do that. Safe Place has always been something we've been interested in. A number of years ago we did a lot of work with Women's Aid and Helping Hands and I suppose for us that's really where it started from. Uh, we have a number of staff, practically all the staff are trained in Helping Hands and we deliver that programme across the school. The more and more work is safeguarding lead, you realise that actually um, it's more than just the education, it's the support as a community and being a really good local community primary school, we decided we needed to reach out and actually not only support the pupils but also the wider family. Um, Safe Place have been amazing. We have had webinars with them, um, we have had resources, cards, posters, um, just lots of information to be able to put up to display and share with their families in the community that we are a safe place, not only for the children but also for parents, families, grannies, aunties and both men and women and I think that's been really, really crucial in not only upskilling the community but also making the staff aware in school that it isn't just a, a one-stop one shop for everybody. I would definitely encourage everybody to become a safe place. Um, I think very often it's a very scary thing when you start talking about safeguarding, domestic violence, mental health. But as a school, we can't educate our children without having this first. This is first and foremost in their children's lives. And for them to be able to be educated, we need the school to be able to be safe and the family at home to be safe. So please sign up, get involved, and hopefully we look forward to supporting not only the community and the children to become a better and brighter future for all. Currently we are a safe place and our journey along this is hopefully to move to become a safe school. There are lots of pathways of participation for you there but for us it's continuing on the journey to become a safe school and I would encourage all of you to get signed up. Okay, we're, we're now going to hear from Fran O'Boyle, the area manager with Women's Aid ABCLM about our safe school project. That me? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, as everybody's very aware, pandemic has created a lot of challenges, um, changes for everyone, but most importantly for the women and children living with domestic abuse. They've been isolated in homes with perpetrators. Um, children have been living in homes that has not been their safe place. Um, children for too long have been called the hidden victims of domestic abuse and they live in homes that they're frightened. Um, they become witnesses to the abuse um, of their mother. They overhear the abuse when they're told to go up the stairs or go into their bed. Um, and the impact of this creates a multitude of behaviours um, in their home and in school. We hear children that talk about school um, as being their safe place. Um, and they need safe adults in their lives to create support networks for them. So unfortunately, during the pandemic, the schools closed. So that took away the children's safe place. Um, and the work that we would normally do as Women's Aid, um, going into schools to support children, um, was also very, very restricted. So Women's Aid, ABCLN and BONUS utilised the time um, 
throughout the pandemic, working in partnership to um, continue to raise awareness of domestic abuse. And we developed the safe school training online um, that can be delivered online. Uh, this training is interactive and very, very informative. Um, the safe place and the progression of safe school training will make a huge difference to any school community. Um, the safe school training um, will increase knowledge, understanding of domestic abuse, and most importantly, the impact of children within that school setting. For the child who has had a night of trauma, the police have been called to their home. Um, they get up the next morning, they've been letting her no sleep. There's no homework to hand in here. Um, these children living with domestic abuse will receive a very informed general response from the school staff that have been trained to know and understand the impact of the children. So it will make a huge difference to the child's support and to the recovery um, on their journey of domestic abuse. So not only are all the staff in the school more informed to recognize and respond to the children living with domestic abuse, they also have the increased confidence to ask the questions, you know, are you safe? Are you ever frightened in your home? Um, and this also extends to employees within the school setting, experiencing domestic abuse or living with um, a perpetrator. Um, the safe school allows staff to access support and information and to reach out for help as well. For the mothers, for any victim of domestic abuse, the school will be known as a safe place. So this will en enable them to access support and information. Working in partnership with the school, a local school, um, there was a referral to women's aid staff that were given the opportunity to meet a woman in the school. This was her only opportunity to access the court when she dropped her children to school. So it was a very calculated and timely response to that woman as her movements were monitored by the perpetrator, every movement, wherever she went, whatever she was doing. So the school gave her an opportunity to come in. So she was literally given a safe place within that school setting. Um, this was the first step in her pathway to support and thereafter her safety for her women, for her and for her children. So when home is not the safe place for children living with domestic abuse, school is. So Louise O'Kane from Women's Aid, Davis LN and Lindsay Harris from Onus recently delivered Safe School Session online. It was a great success and it went really, really well. So I would encourage um, schools to participate in this training and know that by creating a safer community and it will make a difference. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Fran. And we're delighted to be continuing to roll out Safe School, but also we're rolling out Safe Place and Safe Employer to our universities and colleagues as well. And there's just a little slide there just with some some quotes captured by Women's Aid ABCLN. Okay. Antrim and Yatnabi Borough Council have not only been supporting our prevention and early intervention initiatives from our very first awards ceremony in the University of Ulster back in 2010, but also in playing a crucial role in the ongoing development. And tonight we're so pleased to have the Mayor of Antrim and Yatnabi, Billy Webb, with us to talk about our latest safe community project. Uh, thank you, Colette, and, and many thanks for inviting me along to the, the 12th Annual Awards uh, Ceremony. I'm delighted to be here uh, this evening. Uh, Antrim uh, and Newtonabbey Council is, is one of the first organisations to work uh, in partnership with us uh, to develop new initiatives. Uh, and why is that? Because we see it as a priority to ensure that anyone living or working in the borough uh, gets the support that, that they need if they're experiencing domestic abuse. And we were involved from uh, the very beginning of the uh, workplace charters development and alongside other employers, in, including the University of Ulster, Jordanstown, uh, ONUS and staff and service users from Women's Aid, ABCLN, which is Antrim, Balamina, Carrickfergus, Larne and Yutnabi. 
we all provided input into how we could work together to formulate a robust means of supporting uh, employees who were experiencing domestic abuse. And this would be through policy, staff training and communication. And it seems like only yesterday, but back in 2010, Ballyclare was the first town uh, to launch the Safe Place initiative. And this has grown to include over 1600 organisations. And there are over 300 of those in Antrim and Newton Abbey. So yes, we, we've achieved a lot together, but we know there's still uh, work to do. And through working in partnership, uh, we'll expand the support through the Safe Borough project. Now, I've always been aware of the excellent work uh, that has been ongoing uh, and the need for funding, which was why I chose Women's Aid ABCLN as one of my uh, chosen charities for my year in office uh, as mayor. Now, I was on the district policing partnership uh, with Rosemary, Rosemary McGill in the late 90s. And Rosemary had an uphill battle back then to get domestic violence recognised as a priority. And I'm not sure if Rosemary's on uh, viewing tonight, but those of you who know Rosemary know she's nothing if not persistent. Uh, and she succeeded in getting the annual policing plan uh, to include uh, domestic violence as a priority. I also uh, took part in training with uh, other Antrim and Newton Abbey councillors earlier this year uh, to explore what we could do as elected representatives. And I've committed to support and promote initiatives uh, to end domestic and sexual abuse against anyone, regardless of age, gender, political affiliation, or indeed any other factor, because I know it can and it does happen to anyone. So that's why I've arranged for all councillors in our council to refresh our commitment to the White Ribbon Charter uh, by signing a new charter on the 8th of December. And I'm pleased to say that uh, my council remains integral to the partnership working alongside PSNI, Women's Aid and ONUS, and the Safe Community Project. And the project's already underway, uh, with which as we've heard, Rathcool Primary becoming a safe school, uh, and churches and businesses and schools and community groups and individuals in the Rathcool and in the White House area uh, will be coming together as a safe community. And this new prevention and early intervention project uh, will ensure that people recognise domestic abuse and know of the range of support services uh, that are available locally. It was my pleasure as Mayor to be able to represent Andrew Newton Abbey uh, Borough Council and to be in a position to participate in this work. But I know that we can all play our part in working towards a society with zero tolerance to domestic abuse. It starts with us as individuals making that safe place pledge, as I did, never to commit, condone, or to stay silent about domestic or sexual abuse. After that, we can take every opportunity which may present itself to spread the safe place message. And if your home is not a safe place, then there are other places in your community that are. Thank you for this opportunity to be part of this this evening uh, and I'm going to hand over to Josephine and Lindsay who will give us some more detail of the work and partners who will be involved. Okay, uh, thank you to the Mayor um, and for his continuing support. So I'm now going to hand over to some members of the OMAS team and firstly our Safe Place Coordinator Josephine Flynn who's going to tell us about developments in our Safe Place initiative. Hi, uh, good evening. Thank you very much, Colette. So uh, this year we've been continuing our rollout of Safe Place along with our Safe Place partners. And I'm delighted to say that we've now got over 1600 organisations that have signed up to Safe Place since its inception. So the majority of these are in Northern Ireland. However, we are starting to see some organisations join up in the Republic of Ireland, thanks to the work of our Safe Place partners. So any organisation can become a safe place. And we'll now see some examples of the range of safe place organisations within our current Safe Community project, which will be added to in the coming months.
So safe communities are also supported by larger organisations with multiple safe place sites, such as council buildings, northern health and social care trust sites, libraries. And this year, we are delighted to announce that the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service has signed up all of their 63 sites as safe places. Individuals can also play their part too. And this year we launched our Community Safe Place Advocates Scheme, where individuals have been devising new ways of reaching out to people in their communities. We have quite a diverse range of Community Safe Place Advocates raising awareness in their local communities. And I'd like to share just a few examples. I wish that I could share them all, but it, we'd be here all night. So uh, Lindsay Poole from the LAN Area Community Support Group has been really invaluable in sharing uh, safe place messages across social media and with people in the LAN area. Stephanie Hamilton um, has been working in the communities of Gleno and Rallu. Um, which are very, very rural communities. Um, and she has been speaking to local businesses there and encouraging them to sign up a safe place and working towards getting those areas as safe communities. Rebecca Hayes from Stealth Gym has been promoting safe place to customers and clients of her gym. And Hazel Kyle, Sarah Barrett and Christine Branner from the Antrim and Newton Abbey Street Pastors have been taking the safe place cards out with them onto the streets when they are doing their, their work. I'd also like to share with you now a video clip from one of our safe um, community safe place advocates, Susie Ogue from Equality Period. Hi, I'm Susie, the founder and community safe place advocate for Equality Period. Our project focuses on hygiene poverty and period poverty here in Northern Ireland and part of our work is trying to improve access to period products by normalising the provision of free and accessible period care items in all toilets. These are our hair if you need boxes. You'll find them in cafes, restaurants, sports clubs, businesses, council owned and maintained toilet facilities and various other places across Mid and East Antrim. Not only do they contain period care items such as pads and tampons, and crisis support information for anyone who's living with or affected by a period and hygiene poverty, but they also contain the safe place cards. Access to period care can often be used as a weapon in abusive situations, and we know that the financial stress and strain on a family trying to support themselves and afford basic hygiene essentials can cause a lot of stress in relationships. That's why becoming a safe place for us made complete sense. Our boxes are located in toilet facilities where people can access this information confidentially by themselves. We are proud to be a safe place organisation and we encourage others to sign up and play their part. Wonderful to hear from Susie there. So tonight we're also delighted to be announcing our virtual safe place, the launch of this virtual safe place. Um, and this can now be accessed through a QR code on our cards and posters. So anyone will be able to see the full range of support services available for anyone experiencing domestic or sexual violence or abuse. As we know, it can and does happen to anyone, and we want to ensure that everyone has access to the support they need. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. And now another member of Rola's team, Lindsay Harris, uh, will talk to us about our progression pathways. Hello everybody. So over the past year we have adapted our training to online provision but we were very keen to ensure that we were still able to talk to and really engage with people attending and thankfully we can still do that. And that's because over the past 12 years that I've been working with ONUS that as well as making sure we're constantly updating our training through working with our partners and with the latest research, statistics, practice and legislation there have also been so many people who come to the training because they want to talk to someone about domestic or sexual abuse. We know an estimated one in four women and one in seven men have experienced domestic abuse. So we know that there will be people attending the training who have that personal experience. And I have learned so much from delivering training 
over the years from the participants who've maybe stayed behind to talk or ask for information or to share insight what individuals really need, what real life barriers they are facing and how we can work together to do better. All of this informs what we do and how we do it. So tonight, while we're publicly thanking our partners, I want to acknowledge and thank everyone who's given us that insight over the years to share. Because while tonight we're celebrating new ways to make things easier for the people in our communities living with abuse, we want to ensure that the responses we are developing are informed not only by research and what has worked elsewhere, but on what victims and survivors of domestic abuse are telling us directly. And as well as that, we're working with councils to provide the training and understanding, not only within the workplace, but beyond the workplace. Through the training provided for elected representatives and the funding for the Safe Place Awareness Sessions across the community, facilitated either by ONIS or PSNI. We're working with women's aid and schools to reach out and support families and staff within those schools. And we're also working with the four largest church denominations across Ireland to work in partnership with them to get the Safe Place message throughout their congregations. We want any person who discloses they have experienced domestic or sexual abuse to be met with an informed and compassionate response, no matter where they are. They need to hear, I believe you, and I know where you can get support. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne Lindsay, and particular thanks to the Rank Foundation for all of their support over the past few years, and also for their commitment and their continued support in the coming years through the Profit for Good programme to assist OMIS with the rollout of Safe Place All-Ireland and UK-wide. So, just before we go to our awards ceremony, Grace McGurk from the Methodist Church in Ireland is going to tell us about our Safe Church Partnership Project. Thanks, Colette. Um, good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for the welcome and invitation to speak on the work of the church nominations um, as Safe Place Partners. I'm the Learning and Development Officer of the Methodist Church in Ireland, um, and we were the first church denomination to become a Safe Place Partner. Um, the collaborative nature of the work between the Methodist Church in Ireland and on ONUS has meant that following a successful pilot project in 2019 in the south of Ireland, um, more precisely in Carlow, which is approximately a, a six hour round trip, uh, we are now offering safe place training to Methodist churches across the whole of Ireland. The absolutely wonderful work of ONUS has meant with the safe place training sessions moving to an online format, this has meant that this initiative has become far reaching on this island and truthfully has made my job easier, or should I say more efficient, um, as well as helping me with my mileage expenses. I'm pleased to say that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and the Catholic Diocese of Down and Connor have followed the Methodist Church and have also become safe place partners and are offering safe place training to churches in their denominations. It is wonderful to see the three safe place partner churches working together to raise awareness of safe place in their churches and communities, encouraging churches to become safe places and to progress um, to becoming safe churches through onus. Today, there are 208 churches that have signed up to be a safe place, with um, 111 of these having taken additional training to become a safe church. I believe that I'm speaking for all three safe place partnering churches when I say thank you um, to ONUS and especially their administrative team for their help and support as we progress this in our churches and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And it's truly our pleasure to be working uh, with all of the church leaders on the rollout of Safe Place um, All Ireland. So, and now on to our awards of um, 2021. And our first award is a new Safe Skill Award. 
and we're delighted to have presented the UCS Skill Award to Rathkill Primary School. Hello, my name is Emma and I'm Principal of Rathkill Primary School and Nursery Unit. On behalf of the school family and wider community, we want to say a huge thank you to Onus for recognising our school as a safe school. We take great pride in the work that we do to nurture, inspire and flourish with our pupils and our families, but we can only do that with the great support that our community give us. So on behalf of us all, thank you very much. We really appreciate it and it's really given us a spur on to keep doing the work that we do. Thank you. Our next award is a new Gold Workplace Charter Award, which has been presented to the Northern Ireland Civil Service. We now have two Gold Renewal Awards, the first to Causeway Coast and Glens, and the second to Triangle. We are delighted to have 10 Platinum Renewal Workplace Charter Awards, the first to Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council, to Belfast City Council, to Lisburn and Castle Ray City Council. Good evening. Lisburn and Castle Ray City Council is absolutely delighted to receive the Onus Platinum Award for the fourth year in a row. We have a zero tolerance policy to abuse and all our open access facilities are deemed safe places. Staff and the public can access information regarding support if experiencing domestic violence or abuse. Our receptionists and line managers are trained and we have 12 trusted colleagues to support staff. As Platinum members, we have rolled out domestic violence into the city and community, which is financially supported by our policing and community safety partnership. This year, we plan to go even further in partnership with our community groups and our local Chamber of Commerce to encourage as many organisations as possible to become accredited safe places. Thank you so much for this important award. And our next Platinum Award is to Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, to the Ministry of Defence, to the Ministry of Defence Police and to the Northern Health and Social Care Trust. Hi, my name is Cecilia Robinson, Head of Service for Family Support and Safeguarding within the Northern Trust. I am delighted to be receiving the Platinum Workplace Charter Award on behalf of the Northern Trust. This award is a recognition of the Northern Trust's workplace policy and the training provided to support employees affected by domestic violence. Northern Trust is committed to continuing to identify opportunities to develop new initiatives and support all our staff. Thanks a million. Our next Platinum Award is to the Probation Board Northern Ireland, to the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and finally, but by no means lastly, to Women's Aid, ABCLM. Women's Aid ABCLN is delighted to be a safe place partner with ONUS and join with organisations across Northern Ireland to receive our Platinum Award in the Workplace Charter on Domestic Abuse. Women's Aid ABCLN provides confidential support, information and emergency accommodation for women and children who are affected by domestic abuse in Antrim, Ballymena, Carrickfergus, Lorne and Newton Abbey. We established ONUS as a social enterprise in 2007 and we work together to provide safe place awareness raising to communities and partner organisations and to live in safe school initiative in local schools. We are absolutely delighted to receive this award this evening and want to thank everyone for all of your support. Our next award is the presentation of our Safe Borough Renewal Awards and the first Safe Borough Award is to Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council and the second to Mid and East Antrim Borough Council. And finally, our Safe City Awards, the first to Belfast City Council and also to Lisburn and Castle Ray City Council. So congratulations to all awardees and thanks to all of our partners and participating workplace charter organisations.
The awardees photographs, logos and clips will also be used by owners to feature in our 16 days of action social media campaign. Just before I hand over to the chair of the Onus Management Board, Norma Crothers, to wrap up this evening, I would just like to take a few seconds to personally thank the Onus team. We have such a passionate and committed team. Thanks to Lindsay and Kelly, who have been with me since the, out from the beginning, 2009. Thanks to Joe, to our bank of trainers. And a particular wee shout out to our newest members of the team, Eva, Centre Administrator, Rebecca, our digital marketing assistant, and Erin, our safe place administrator. They have been invaluable additions to the team, not only in assisting us to extend our reach in line with our new online provision, but also assisting us in the production of tonight's event. So finally, over to Norma. Thank you, Colette. First of all, thank you to everyone who's spoken this evening and thank you all for coming to listen uh, and join us in this evening. There's been three key messages that have really came through through tonight's event. Firstly, we all must play our part. And if we do that, we can help to stop domestic and sexual violence and abuse. Secondly, we've seen examples of the very wide range of individuals and organisations all working together. That partnership working is key to helping us form communities that work for change. And thirdly, every individual can make a huge difference. Regardless of who you are, what position you hold in society, it starts with the personal commitment to never commit, condone or remain silent on domestic abuse. We must acknowledge that domestic abuse is a problem that impacts on all of us in society and be prepared to play your part in, in supporting those affected and send a clear message to perpetrators that domestic abuse will not be tolerated. We all must, all also must provide a safe place for anyone affected by domestic violence to confidentially access information. Lockdown in the pandemic presented so many challenges, especially for those who are living lockdown with their abuser. This has highlighted the need to tackle domestic violence in a joined up way. Our response to domestic and sexual abuse cannot come from one source. Our best response will require different agencies and different services working together to meet the needs of the individual as they try to move away from an abusive relationship safely. We must combine our efforts and our skills and work together to present every opportunity to understand and support the people in our community trying to move away from abuse. Tonight is not just a recognition of what can be done, but also sharing that good practice. And I hope to be here next year, celebrating how we've built on this and how we have all thought of something else that we can do to eradicate domestic violence and abuse. As ever, thank you to everyone who's worked with us over the years to help us to develop ever better practice to help more people live life free of abuse and create a home that is truly a safe place. We know that every person we work with represents greater access to information for anyone's, anyone affected by domestic violence or abuse. A huge congratulations to all our awardees and thanks to all our Safe Place organisations. Thank you also to our range of funders who have enabled us to continue to extend our pathways for participation and increase our number of safe places. And a huge thank you to the entire OMS team who work, whose work is unparalleled in awareness raising on domestic abuse and violence and also to the management board who support the organisation in their work. Uh, a special note of thanks to our outgoing chair, Jackie Patton, who has just uh, who's recently stepped down in her role uh, as chair and has, has did that incredibly well for the last two years. And I'm honoured to be uh, picking up the, the mantle from her. And finally, if we can always just ask you to follow us on social media, um, on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, just to help us encourage that participation and awareness raising. Thank you all so much again and good night.